Travelling in these northern lands can be incredibly hazardous. The weather changes very fast. You can go out in the morning and it's sunny and be in these sorts of conditions by the afternoon, making not only picking your route difficult because you can't see the bumps in the terrain, but also navigation. No map can tell me where those danger places are. Only the locals have that information. I'm in Labrador, sub-Arctic Canada. This is one of the least populated places on Earth. When traders from the Hudson's Bay Company first came here in the 17th century in search of furs, they called it the Barren Lands. This is home to the Innu people, who comprise the Montagnier and Nascapi tribes. But to them, this land of snow and spruce teems with life. These two tribes of the Innu live side by side and share a common culture. My first stop is the hunting wigwam of Daniel Gabriel. He's a highly respected Montagnier hunter and has even guided Pierre Trudeau, the former Canadian Prime Minister, on hunting and fishing expeditions. He offered me my first cup of Labrador tea, an infusion of leaves from a local plant. The Innu swear it keeps colds at bay. Daniel, je suis très content d'être ici. Merci. Bienvenue sur le territoire Innu. C'est va te montrer la culture, qu'est-ce qu'on fait, les Innu. Coucher les caribous. The inner way of life is inextricably linked with one of the wonders of the natural world, the migration of a million caribou that cross Labrador each year. But in an area of over a million square kilometers, finding them is like looking for a needle in a haystack. Francois Mackenzie is one of the last shaman who knows how to locate the caribou. Il n'avait pas un, un vieux accroché de son tambour. Vous voyez, comme une télévision. Tu vois, lui et Caribou savaient. Lui aussi, Makouchan. Les Caribou aussi dansaient. Attendre les chasseurs. I spent all day with Daniel and his party hunting the herd. They explained to me that the caribou is their principal source of food. When the herd is within reach, they will kill as many as they can. This necessity has taught them to be remarkable marksmen. If they shoot 20 bullets, they'll kill 20 deer. Even at the end of the day, when the conditions deteriorated to near whiteout, they were still just as accurate. For Daniel's great aunt Philomene, the arrival of the caribou herd means weeks of extra work. While the meat can be left outside to freeze, the skin is prepared for tanning. Any fat on the hide is first removed using a length of copper pipe flattened at one end.
Next, the hide is de-haired, while Daniel prepares a traditional Innu delicacy of leg marrow. This provides essential vitamins through the winter months. The caribou is central to the Innu's most important feast, called the Mokashan, a celebration that honours the animal. Respect for all animals is central to Innu beliefs. These bones will be returned to the forest, as it would be disrespectful to leave them just lying around. Traditionally, the Montagnier used all parts of the caribou. If they weren't eating the marrow, then they used the leg bones to fashion dehairing tools like this one. Today, those tools are mostly made from metal. The Montagnier are pragmatic people. They have to be to live in an environment like this one. The motor auger is a far easier way to get to the fresh water trapped under a metre of ice. Their grandparents would have had to chip their way through with an ice chisel. <laughs> Labrador is one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. In winter, temperatures plumb to minus 60 degrees and snow can drift five meters deep. All this and only a few hours of daylight. In summer, it's no better. It swarms with biting black flies and mosquitoes. For most modern Innu, it means staying in their centrally heated homes on the reservations, but not for all. Across the lake from the Montagnais, I set up camp waiting for the arrival of an Escapi family. These little birds are Canada Jays, or as some people call them, Whiskey Jacks. Now that name comes from the Nascapi, Whiskey Chan. But it's also this bird that gives the name to the traditional Nascapi house, Whiskey Chan Chuap, which means Whiskey Jack's nest, because it's built from little sticks. David and Susan Swapi finally arrive and start building their Whiskey Chan Chuap. The first thing to do is flatten the six feet of powder snow into a compact base. It's a family affair. Children are given time off school to preserve the knowledge of the old ways. Once the snow has been packed hard, the young spruce boughs are arranged in a circle to form the floor. Although the Nascapi and Montagnier live side by side and are in most ways similar, their homes can be quite different. The pointed wigwam of the Montagnier contrasts sharply with this shelter. Traditionally, it would be covered with caribou skins, but now they use canvas. They only take about an hour to put up, which is essential when the weather can change so dramatically. Living in a big freezer has other advantages. The caribou meat can be kept for months buried outside, but there's also an abundance of fresh food to be found under the ice. The sprig of spruce warns travelers of a fishing hole. There's nothing haphazard about why they've chosen to fish here. Each hook is placed with the knowledge of the currents 
and where the fish are likely to be. This hole is the nearest to camp and it took us two hours to get here. Ah, never. I squeeze this. Yeah. But no luck this time. Nothing's taken the bait. We'll check it out another day. This is a land of rivers and lakes. Winter is the easiest time to travel. We moved to another ice hole where a fishing net was set two days ago. The hole was well and truly frozen over and it's hard work breaking through to the net. By the time we reach the net, the northern light is fast disappearing, but we're rewarded with seven lake trout. It's a race to get back to camp before night, and there's the ever-present danger of open water, where fast-moving currents prevent the ice forming properly. Night and the outside temperature drops dramatically. Far from the sea, inland Labrador can be colder than the North Pole. It's a time to snuggle up with the warmth of the wood stove and begin cutting the felt lining for the moccasins. I asked Danielle if the old timers are still teaching the young how to make traditional clothing. Il apprend aussi à des jeunes à faire le, les pantoufles, top, les, les mitaines, puis les raquettes, les caribots, tanner les caribots, top. Philomene measures me up for a pair of mucklucks, which are basically moccasins with a canvas gaiter sewn onto them. These are traditional footwear for use with snowshoes. The buckskin is first cut to size, with an added width to accommodate the felt lining, and then the laborious job of puckering the leather to make the toe of the moccasin begins. They usually take her about a day or two to make, depending on the amount of decoration she puts into them. The Indian moccasin design has been adopted worldwide because of its comfort. When you look at a muckluck, it seems incredible that anything so flimsy could keep you warm, but there are some good reasons why it does. Firstly, your sweat can pass through the buckskin, so it's not inside the boot to freeze and make you cold. Secondly, the boot allows your foot to move, which also helps to keep you warm, and there's no hard sole to conduct heat away. All those things make it the perfect boot to use with the traditional snowshoe. The Montagnier snowshoe is an intricate weave of strips of caribou hide known as babiche. This is tensioned around a jointed wooden frame that has been carefully bent into shape. Its round design helps spread the weight in soft snow. They're strong, light and last for years. This environment's all about mobility. Being able to get about in the snow is critical. Snow machines are great, they can get you to places, but what happens when you get off them? This, you sink straight up to your middle in the snow. So you've got to have some way of walking on top of it. And that's where the snowshoe comes in. If you can get back up onto your snow machine,
that's the difference a pair of Montagnier snowshoes make. <laughs> Sometimes. The lure of beaver brought the Europeans to this land and furs have long been the currency of trade. The most sought after item along with the gun was the metal axe, which quickly replaced the stone axe. A man alone in the forest can cut firewood, cut through ice to water, make a shelter and fashion one of the most efficient methods of catching fur-bearing animals like marten or bear. It's a trap called the Samson Post Deadfall. The design has remained unchanged for generations. Historically, these traps would be set in lines, often along riverbeds, for up to 50 miles. Whole families work these trap lines. Trapping remains an integral part of the inner way of life. Making this trap is a lot of effort, but it will last several years. It's cunningly fashioned so that once set, the animal can only reach the bait from one direction, which will trigger the upper lock to fall and crush it. <laughs> Daniel, comment ça La map. Il va sentir le, la peau là-bas. Oui. Perdrie. On va monter ici. Puis on va Ça, ça va tomber. D'accord. Il, il est mort. Il est mort. Dans le coup. Afterwards, a trek across the frozen lake to one of Daniel's many fishing holes. <laughs> Good grief. <laughs> the, have you got the fish or has it got you? The fish has been hooked for some time and is half dead. That is a monster fish. Blimey. That easily weighs 30 pounds. That's a Kokomesh lake trout. I wonder what it was they were going to catch with such big hooks. Well, you know, this is one place you don't have to exaggerate about the size of the fish. That's a monster. God, grief. <laughs> Fantastic. You got one. Yeah. The next day we checked the deadfall trap and we'd got a martin. There's still plenty of them in these forests. Ptarmigan are beautifully camouflaged and equally as well equipped as we are with finely splayed and feathered feet that act like their own little snowshoes. But with an inu's sharp eye, they're easy game. Can I take some of those feathers from you? Yeah. Merci. One of the best Montagnier tips I've come across is to take the down feathers from the ptarmigan and shove them in your gloves on a cold day. That way, you've got the original down-filled glove. It's fantastic. Merci. Mm -hmm. 
The traditional accompaniment to ptarmigan or any Inu dish is bannock. This was introduced by Scottish trappers and proved an immediate hit. To make it, mix two cups of flour with a pinch of salt and two teaspoons of baking soda. Add water, shape and bake on top of the sheet metal stove for about 10 minutes. Oui, merci. Mm, c'est excellent, That's really good. <laughs> this is a typical hunter's meal. The ptarmigan's easily caught, it's cooked very simply, and it tastes great. The only thing lacking is a bit of conversation, and that's because I can't speak Montagnier. We going chichwe. Cold, emptiness, the stillness of snow, and the clear northern light. There's a majesty to these barren lands. And take it from me, living in a wigwam, with or without pocket hunters, is surprisingly comfortable. The stove to keep you warm, the fragrance of the spruce bough bed, and if you're lucky, you can witness one of the most spectacular sights on earth. The Innu live in an environment where the forces of nature can overwhelm you at any moment. Today, most live in centrally heated houses, just like any Canadian but you neglect nature at your peril. If you travel in the barren lands, you'd be a fool not to take advantage of modern technology like this, just as the Innu do. But don't be seduced by it. Sooner or later, things go wrong. And that's when you realize that the old knowledge is still the key to survival here.